Gremlins. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this afternoon um, for what will be um, an interesting conversation um, looking at the UN uh, declared uh, statement in theme on the International Women's Day. We know um, for a fact that uh, Women's Day happened on the 8th of March. Uh, it was a, a, a day that was celebrated internationally. And uh, today, uh, myself uh, and Lazo Lagati and uh, Comrade uh, Nospi uh, will be delving into that conversation um, to talk about the significance of International Women's Day in 2022. Um, 
of course, uh, understanding international politics and understanding where we are today, um, and looking again at the UN, the United Nations as, a, as an organization, as a hegemonic uh, organization, and what it means for African um, people, in particular, African women. I am aware that my fellow panelists, as well as uh, uh, the hosts, uh, seem to be having challenges uh, with regards to their connection. So I am a little bit tempted to get the conversation started uh, and maybe just take you through, um, you know, my thoughts uh, on, on the day as well as the, the, the theme itself uh, whilst we, we wait uh, their, their connection. I'll just give it a, a second or two before I get started just to see uh, if, if I can if I can continue without them whilst you wait so that I do not keep you waiting for too long. Um, I'll just give it 30 seconds um, just to honor your time. Right. Um, In the absence of everyone else, I suppose I will <laughs> give myself uh, the, the starting opportunity. For those who do not know me, my name is Gekele Zohena. I'm the deputy president of ASAPO. I am a, I consider myself a gender activist, uh, a mother, a black consciousness activist. I consider myself an Africanist and I consider myself black. And it is the basis of my struggle. It is the basis of my thoughts. It is the basis of my very existence. So when I was asked to reflect on the subject of breaking the bias as the theme of this year's International Women's Day, as declared by the uh, United Nations, um, I had to think about its relevance to us as African women. Um, and you know, just to get us started, I quickly wanted to acknowledge the fact that the International Women's Day is an opportunity to celebrate the socioeconomic and political achievements of women. But what I generally find quite interesting uh, is how the, U the United Nations, the actual system, has proven to be a vital instrument for advancing uh, America's hegemony. Its ideas and projects has been allowed to convert uh, you know, serious programs uh, and, and, and dates into uh, holidays. Uh, take for instance, this very important day, which is the International Women's Day. It's been turned into a card giving holiday with Insta worthy poses that do nothing to change their lives or celebrate the achievements of women globally. Uh, last year, the theme was uh, it, uh, closing the gap, the equality gap, and they had this pose. Uh, this year, there was the karate chop pose, which literally did nothing to change the lives of women, but they continue, um, I think, by my standards, uh, to reduce the significance and importance of this very important day. So I just wanted to then go back and reflect on the socialist origins of International Women's Day and how it was actually Russian women who were the first to celebrate International Women's Day on the 8th of March in 1913. Four years later in 1917, uh, March the 8th, there was another protest of working class women in St. Petersburg who were angry about rising food prices and the deteriorating living conditions um, that helped to trigger the Russian Revolution. Now, this set the date not just in Russia, but for the rest of Europe. And in 1922, Lenin established uh, March the 8th as a communist holiday in the new Soviet Union. The International Women's Day remained a state-sponsored and communist holiday celebration of women's contribution to the state throughout the 20th century. And it was only in 1978, I think, uh, no, 1975, um, during the International Women's Year that the UN celebrated their first International Women's Day on March the 8th. 
The UN was careful to avoid any hint of protest, calling it a time to reflect on progress made and celebrate act of courage and determination of ordinary women. In 1977, um, the United Nations adopted a resolution proclaiming March the 8th as a United Nations Day for Women's Rights and International Peace. Now, this is a far cry from the communist protest origins of the first Social International Women's Day. Uh, and so, you know, for me, and because of this very socialist um, feminist protest, I could not help but be inspired by the socialist feminists of 1913, as well as the women of 1917, who filled the streets with cries of bread and peace, bread and peace, and who then became instrumental in forcing uh, Tsar Nicholas II to, to abdicate. Um, and you then can see how International Women's Day became a catalyst uh, for change. Now, you see, even then, uh, the issues of oppression of women had been carefully diagnosed to show that women suffered oppression from both class and sex. So it's not just uh, oppression because we are women. Um, there's also class issues. And it was Lenin who, during a conversation with Clara Zetkin, who was one of the women who were behind the very first International Women's Day, who advanced the argument um, that the special oppression of women uh, in a capitalist society has in fact a double root. Firstly, uh, like national minorities, generally women suffer as a group from political inequality and in the second, women are imprisoned in what Lenin terms domestic slavery that forces them into unpaid labor in the household. Now back home in 1956, uh, when the pass laws were active, um, the pass laws related to the oppression of women because of class and sex, as well as race. And it was that that drove the women to stand up against the restriction of movement, where they were actually being forced, not just into their own uh, domestic slavery, but also domestic slavery uh, in the homes of white people in urban areas. So when the past laws were initially introduced, they focused on men, but in time, uh, the white oppressors realized that they needed people to work in their kitchens, and so they simply extended uh, the past laws to include women. In 1956, the women were like, we are not having this. Um, and because of that, uh, we know that there was a catalytic, a catalytic event um, that saw uh, the past laws being challenged. Now, this gets to show us how women have been a motive force of change, uh, catalytic change, not just here at home, but also internationally. But um, just going back to the socialist uh, history, of uh, International Women's Day. And at this point, we are, we are now using a socialist lens uh, to review uh, International Women's Day and the state of black women in capitalist and patriarchal South Africa in, 22, in 2022. Now, it will be very improper not to look at the ideology of Marxism and in particular, the concept of natural division of labor. Now, Marx, talks about the act of child breeding as the beginning of the division of labor, because this very act of making babies makes both wife and child slaves to the husband. To bring this closer to home, uh, Indabaga Malogazana is brought into the, in, into, into the picture. Now Malogazana, or what we call Umagoti, is brought into the marital home to reproduce, to cook, to clean, and to tend to amasim, uh, which will you know, loosely translate to food patches or fields. Um, now, when we look at the master slave history, we know that female slaves were good for both labor as well as the reproduction of other slaves, uh, which then means that the slave owner had uh, additional means of production. Again, we are talking capitalism um, at the expense of women. So the growth of one's ability uh, to increase their means of production. And here at home, uh, we know that women must then uh, have 
a lot more children, uh, which is called Wandisa Isbom. These kids will then tend to the livestock fetch the water, and Malogazana, who marries into this family, must also remember that the land that she is going to work hard tilling is not her own. She's just Magodi. Um, she can never really truly inherit from the added value she produces with her free labor. The exploitation of Black women's labor and the burden of care is placed solely on the shoulders of Black women to raise and care for the family. This type of oppression uh, by patriarchy, which is embedded in our culture, religion, tradition, and even love continues unabated. Now, sadly, we know that black men continue to benefit from the suppression of black women. And black men choose to be blind to the existence of patriarchy or its benefit. Now, today, as we speak of breaking the bias, which is, in fact, the theme of the International Women's Day 2022, I'm reminded that patriarchy, like white privilege, is a system that bestows unfair benefit, and the beneficiaries of uh, privilege will seldom acknowledge having benefited from the system. Comrades, privilege is invisible to those who have it. We know this for a fact. But allow me to appeal to the Pan-Africanist in you to imagine a conversation about white privilege between a regular white man and a black man. I know you'd imagine that the white man would say racism is a figment of the imagination of the black man, and that economic exclusion is because the black man is lazy or that he is uneducated and cannot see or activate the myriad of opportunities that are in the land. He might just mention the great big chip on the shoulder of the black man and deny that he has benefited from white privilege and claim that BEE and affirmative action have leveled the playing field and that his gradual but very easy rise um, to the executive position he now occupies is as a result of his hard work, self-application and drive. I won't bore you with illustrating a conversation between a black man and a black woman, which takes the same trajectory with the black men saying that actually there is gender empowerment. You should be grateful. As men, we are victims of reverse discrimination. No one cares about men. It's women this and women that. And again, as you can see, we are here talking about International Women's Day and the answer would, the question would be, where is International Men's Day? Which also reminds me that by the way, every time we say black lives matter, the beneficiaries of white privilege say all lives matter. Black men have a bias towards the preservation of patriarchy. And because they derive a benefit from its existence, it is a fact that no one is motivated to dismantle a system of oppression if they directly benefit from it. We know for fact that the United Nations and its member states benefited from apartheid. And this is why it took them forever to impose sanctions. Black men are sadly beneficiaries of women oppression, and they remain complicit in the oppression of women in the home, on the streets, and in the workplace. Comrades, I dream of a day when Azapo will take Black women from the margins of society to the center of the revolution, because Black women are the most marginalized people in this country. Theirs is a war against patriarchy, capitalism, racism, poverty and war. Ningzwegas, I said war because the war and the battlefield is in fact being fought on our bodies. Unfortunately, whilst patriarchy turns women into slaves, white supremacy places whites on top of all blacks oppressing all of us and ensuring that the struggle of black men is intertwined with the struggle of black women. It is therefore in the interest of black men to be allies of black women, because the truth is until black women are free, none of us will be free. So as we look to find ways to break the bias, it will help us to look in the mirror to locate our own bias, to see the misogyny directed at black women, to look at the words we use to describe black women and realize their freedom holds the key to the elusive liberation of all black people in Azania. 
women are a multi-force that we are yet to galvanize to action because if we can galvanize uh, black women into action we have a better chance of being able to change uh, this regime that is anti-black that is um anti-black women i thank you let me see if uh we have our uh host back uh so that we can continue with this conversation Comrade Naspiu or Comrade Lazola, anyone? Hi, Comrade, can you hear me? We can hear you now. All right, thank you, Comrade. Apologies for the uh, many network issues on my side. No, that's fine. I'm sure uh, you can continue now. I'm also back All online. Right. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Okay. Um, um, Let's you okay, so I'll just continue then. Okay, thanks, thanks, Comrade Chair. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me in this conversation, and um, thank you for uh, Deputy Chairperson's uh, lovely introduction. I think mine is to touch on a couple of issues when it comes to International Women's Day, um, but also mainly my focus will be to kind of look at um, the erasure of Black women from the liberation struggle. Um, I think one is to begin to look at what is what International Women's Day should be. It should be more of a celebration rather than an arena where we are trying to tackle issues and we are still trying to say as women we are not heard and as women we are still suffering under the bias that is faced by this country. And I think the most important thing for us to look at is why is there a bias and how this bias exists. And the bigger answer to that is obviously it is patriarchy. What we also need to understand about patriarchy is that it is a system that has seeped into every single industry. It is a system of living that highly favors masculine, or rather I can say our male um, counterparts rather than the female counterparts. It makes the woman less than, it makes the woman beneath the man. No matter, and, and, and we see this every single day in workspaces, in political spaces, in communities where women, no matter how much effort you put in, the presence of a masculine figure will ultimately overshadow you. This is uh, specifically why we need to look at such conversations around breaking the bias, because more and more we are now seeing uh, bigger sort of consequences when it comes to the bias. We are seeing a lot of gender-based violence because women's voices are silenced and women's voices are not heard. And the presence of a woman is not counted as a presence of a human being. Uh, the statistics of gender-based violence in 2021 alone actually categorize South Africa as the most dangerous country in the world for women. These are the types of issues that we need to look at as a black nation. Why is it that a nation and a home can be so unsafe for women? And uh, one of the, the issues and one of the factors um, that we see to the erasure of these black heroines is the patriarchal system. And one of the, the real uh, sort of uh, examples of this, you can see it in the media, the way the media depicts uh, the, 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 the black heroines that fought for liberation is highly catering to the male gaze. It is catering to the masculine aspect of these women being supporters, being mothers, bandaging our male counterparts, but not speaking about these women in their revolutionary capacity, not speaking about them running on the field and shooting and catching grenades and throwing tear gas grenades back. These are the info, this is the information that we are missing. This is the type of reporting that entrenches further the bias within the media sector. And this is absolutely important because Kedas, we find a situation whereby information and history is manipulated and therefore patriarchy is fully entrenched, it is then remaining in society, even in terms of us looking back in our history. This is why looking at the bias is so important, because then even the type of history that we are looking at is biased. How then do we locate our future if we can't even have a proper essence and pure history that is equal in terms of gender representation? Um, and I think, Comrade Chair, I'm going to pause there at this point in time. Thank you, Comrade Lazola, um, and thank you, Comrade Kekeletso. And once more, I would like to apologize for the technical glitches that we've had earlier, but I suppose they also speak to the situation that women find themselves in, in the world and not only in South Africa.
but bringing it back home, more specific to what our country looks like. What is it, and I'm posing this question to both of you, what is it that in your opinion needs to be done in order to ensure that we move away from complaining as women? and take center stage in re-engineering the future. Because remember, in the future is potential. So what is it that is going to shift us above from the state where we are trapped in of only saying we are uh, uh, um, looked down upon, we are not respected, opportunities are only passed by in the name of women and end up looking at the political landscape specifically where you will find a number of women of women coming together, supporting a male in order to ascend to a position that could easily be filled by a fellow woman. So what is it that needs to take place? Is it in our mindset? Is it in our hearts? Is it uh, a matter of just us waking up one day, converging and taking a bold stand? to reclaim our space in society because I have always looked at women as community builders. And yet over time with that status, with that potential, we never seem to quite get it to the point where we should be. Uh, who would you like to, to, to have start first, comrade? Um, it, it can be anybody, but for sequence sake, let's start with you. <laughs> we are long <laughs> <laughs> um, comrade, I think for me, more than anything, um, we have to understand that patriarchy is a system, just like racism. It is an embedded system where the mind is controlled to work in a particular way. Now, oppression and, and oppression happens and then oppression is imbibed. Oppression becomes personalized. And when you look at the status of women, you realize that we have taken oppression and we've made it our own and we oppress ourselves further because the system from, you know, the reason why I went with the issue of the home, I wanted to show that our oppression starts in the home before we can even leave. From the time that we are born, particularly as black women, we know that you must learn to clean you must learn to cook, you must learn to do laundry, mm -hmm. etc. from the time that mm -hmm. we are kids. So we are domesticated and laborers from the time that we are kids. And so this notion of free labor, of free, well, enslavement yes. is something that we are socialized into as children. It is therefore critical that movements like Azabo um, then find women and begin to have conversations that conscientize them of the slavery in the system and then find ways to pull women out of the system and lift them into what I initially referred to as a motive force. We need to be the motive force. We need to be the force of change, but we cannot be the force of change unless we understand our oppression, deal with our oppression, pull ourselves out of the oppression, and then become a catalytic movement that then changes society. Thank you, Keke. Lazola? Yes. Um, you know, Comet, uh, Comet uh, Keke mentioned something so important, um, and I agree. Uh, that the, one of our biggest issues is our internalized patriarchy as women. We have internalized hypermasculinity. You find it even in different spaces whereby to ascend to leadership or maintain leadership, we tend to take on a more masculine role. And uh, the, the beginning to, to undo this is to accept our feminine energy as power. It is or to accept um, and educate each other on concepts like your black feminism, on womanism, that identify us as political agent bodies in each and every space that we exist in. And these types of, of um, sort of uh, concepts, they also help us to realize ourselves as black women with our challenges um, and with our, our struggles that we face for being women and for being black women in spaces and continue to raise our voices. And the, most, the other important issues that we need to look at is policy change in, in the country. As the Azapo, we should be able to lead a more gender conscious policy project 
our policies need to look at not just creating equality but equity because what we need to understand is that patriarchy enforces issues of inequality and we don't rectify that by just placing women in positions but we rectify it by creating equality this is women banding together and creating access those that have a particular educational experience or, or quality or any type of degree you share we share our skills so that we can be able to empower each other and build confidence as a unit the other aspect we need to look at is the education aspect education really is 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 um void of making the youth understand what is the issue with patriarchy, how women and young girls can realize themselves as young black feminists that don't have to put their black bodies on the line fighting men. But we can look at it at an intersectional level whereby both men and women can come together and realize a gender conscious society. And last but not least is to actually um, sort of unite as women. We need, to, we need to have honest conversations as women whereby we are honest to say we have a habit of looking at each other as competition. How do we break that barrier? We come together and we, we exclude these types of masculine feelings that, that make us believe that competition offends one. We need to look at each other as equals. We need to look at each other and mirror each other's struggles. Therefore, we can mirror each other's successes. Is that possible, though? Truly speaking, um, Comrade Lazola, do you think where we are as women mm. today? Because I, you know, in 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 the decades that I've been alive, I have come to realize that mm. sometimes, very unnecessarily, women become the blockades, the yeah. disablers, the cripplers of yeah. fellow women. Mm -hmm. It starts it starts yeah. from sibling rivalry, friendships, mm. relationships with males. We are always somehow, I do not know why, found at the center of destroying a fellow sister when we should be uplifting each other. So in the meetings mm. that we, we could possibly have, do you think we are ready mm. emotionally, psychologically? Are we ready fully to support each other as women and move away from comparing each other in a degrading way? Yeah. Can we do yes. in your in your honest assessment, are we capable of doing that as women? You know, comrade, in small pockets I've seen this happen and I've seen nothing but success. Mm -hmm. I think the issue that we don't put up the most is accountability. We create safe spaces that are meant for women to share. That creates trust and that lowers the levels of competition and comparing. However, when we don't emphasize accountability to each other and the space, then we find issues of betrayal, then we find issues of comparing still cropping up in the long run. We need accountability mechanisms, just like any other ecosystem has accountability mechanisms, comrade. And we also need to be clear that our accountability mechanisms are not about delegitimizing or pulling women down, but they are about creating the space. We need to... Um, as women, individually, this starts individually, my comrades, to say when I enter this space, I have a, a, a responsibility to this space, just like the space has a responsibility to us. So in ourselves, we also need to look at ourselves. We can't lay complacent and say patriarchy is just sitting on us. We need to be accountable to ourselves and our safe spaces. When someone breaks the code on a safe space, there has to be an accountability mechanism that we will enforce. Those types of of, 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 of um, sort of practices, comrades, also build systems. That's how the systems of patriarchy were built. This is how the system of the intersectionality can be built as well. Uh, comrade Lazola, okay. you spoke earlier um, about um, how we must embrace our masculine um, energies as well as our feminine um, energies. Yes. And right now I'm, I'm intrigued um, by what you just said, because um, I look, I mean, I come from corporate um, and I think I've surrounded myself with, 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 with men in very top positions. And what characterizes mm. men interaction by my, by my uh, standards is competition and their egotistical yeah. ways of doing things. They are constantly being the bull in the house. There's this thing, mm. they, they 
only be one bull. And so they go in there and they compete for a space. The bias that I want us to challenge is the bias that says women cannot do that. Women cannot um, compete with each other. We need to be able to compete with each other and still be sisters Mm. and still be willing to lift Mm. each other up. We need to be able to Mm. argue with each other and fight with each other without it being called catty and bitchy. Because when men fight amongst themselves, they fight and tomorrow they get on with the business. But when we do it, it is called something different. So I am saying I'm not not going to challenge someone who is above me. I'm going to challenge you. If it is a leadership position that I want, believe you me, I'm coming for you. But I'm not doing it from a place of malice. I'm doing it because I firmly believe that I'm better for the job. And it should be okay for me to want to ascend to that position. It's as simple as all that. It's not because I'm pulling you down. I will support you where you are believe you me but i'm telling you because i have agency i am coming for what i believe i'm rightfully deserved not because you're Mm. a woman i should not challenge you i'm about to challenge you believe you me so we need Mm. to check our balance our bias because if men are allowed to compete if men are allowed to argue if men are allowed to see things differently we should be able to. So the language that is used around women is completely different. When I'm when I am being assertive, I'm seen as being cheeky and pushy. But when men are being assertive, mm. it's okay. So we need to change our bias in the language and in the way that we expect, particularly women leaders, to be. On that note, women leaders. Sorry, yes. comrade. I, I hear on that note. <laughs> I, I, I would like to I would like to pose a question to to Comrade Kekelitz on the note of uh, as women leaders to be. We are in a space where the entire country I can safely say is crying whether aloud or silently for a female president. Do you think this phenomenon because it remains a phenomenon at the moment? Do you think it's going to be a welcome um, development? in the route to 2024. Do you think there is a, 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 a possibility that we can actually come up with a black female president? We should be the first for this country, by the way, at the rate that things are going, because politically, we are in a space where you find women not taking the top positions in any organization. We are genuinely led with generally and very consistently led except for uh, maybe one other or two. But now let's, let's look at our community's black consciousness. Do you think we can be able to achieve getting a black woman to ascend to power as a president of this country? That you are even asking me the question is problematic in itself. We need a leader. Whether that leader happens to be female or not is irrelevant. What we need is a leader that is going to lead the nation. And if she so happens to be a woman, then that would be great. Because we understand that women's leadership is a leadership that is uh, that uses that combination that I spoke of, the masculine energy as well as that feminine energy. And so we are able to both be firm and care at the same time. And we need a caring government. We need a responsive government. Um, and we know for a fact We only need to look at what the ANC is building to realize that we have a leadership vacuum. And we have a leadership vacuum because women are scared to ascend to those positions because we are constantly told not to aspire, not to compete, not to want to push ourselves to that level. We must, we are told to be humble. We are taught that humility is a good trait to have as a woman. And so we now need to raise a generation of women that are not humble. We need to raise a generation of women that take up opportunities, that take up space. Azapo has done phenomenally well by ensuring that they, they, you know, the current SC is quite representative of women, but we know that the majority of those women are deputies. This is a fact, Mm -hmm. but at least it's a step in the right direction because we are there. We are able to then provide our leadership. We are then able to provide the feminine insight into growing Azapo and to develop the Azapo that we want to see that will be the Azapo that finishes 
the, the, the unfinished liberation project. So to answer your question, yes, we have the capability as women, we have the capability in Azapo to produce female leaders that can take presidency. What we need to do as Azapo is develop the organization in such a way that we can compete at that level um, to be able to then put up a president, a female a candidate, if that's what we want to do as a president of the country. But we cannot be folding a woman just because it's, it, is, it is a thing that we want to do. We need to do so because that woman is capable. I said to you earlier that the black woman is the most oppressed and the most marginalized. So if we can get a woman who is both oppressed and marginalized, who understands a lived experience of oppression, that person is in a better position to drive and galvanize other women as a motive force towards changing the lives of other people. Like I said, unless the black woman is liberated, none of us will taste freedom. May I take this opportunity to read uh, one of the questions? There are questions that are, um, have been posed to us. And Dusom PC is, um, has asked the question, are there any programs that are running or planned to, to deliberately train young black women within Azapo? Well, I think you two are the best to respond to this because you are part of the two women, part of the, of, of the, of the collective of women. Just the two of you here joining us today are, are, are best suited to just respond to this. In your opinion, both you, Lazola and, and Gege, but let's start with Lazola this time. Within Azapo, are there programs that are set aside to ensure that we, 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 we give uh, Black women a chance? Currently, uh, Comrade, thank you for that question. Currently, we are working on those from the gender desk. I've had those conversations to actually uh, bring up these types of programs. Because specifically, uh, my point of view is that we need to begin with the mind of the woman. We can't keep pushing women onto the battle lines and sacrifice their black bodies. This is how we end up with suicides from women. This is how we end up with alcoholics as women. And this is actually then rampant in the feminist circles. First of all, that's the first thing we need, to, we need to look at. When we start with the mind of the woman and free and liberate her, that is when we can start pushing women onto the battle lines because we are losing a lot of women because we keep on pushing them. So we are having these conversations and we are designing these types of programs. Um, and in fact, we are half, more than halfway through that so that we can be able to present and get the buy-in of other women. And um, I think that, it, it, that question is very important and those programs will be important in creating a balanced women because I don't agree that we need a leader that's not humble. I think that will not get us anywhere. That might get us into the hands of further masculinity, probably further war. We need someone who's level-headed, who's humble and assertive, and who can also take up space. Thank you, Lazola. Um, over to you, Gegelezo. What are your views on this? Look, um, I think we work uh, quite closely uh, with the gender desk. Um, the current SC is not very polarized in the sense that we don't have, you know, departments that are working in isolation. We are working together to develop programming, like I said, that will one, um, empower women at a personal level, that women understand their own individual agency. Then we are designing program that programs that are looking at ensuring that women are active participants of society, um, be it as activists, be it in the economic space, um, and be it uh, as, as just members of society or in politics. Um, so we are looking at developing programs that would then enable women to see themselves as catalysts, like in each individual who is a member of us or people that we interact with in communities. And we must remember that we, we have a call uh, to develop an action orientated uh, as well, which means that we must go to the people so that our actions are not just internal. So in as much as we are developing programs where our own uh, comrades would be taken through uh, the, 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 the programs that help them to, 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 to grow as individuals, to, to have agency, 
we need to do the same for other women because um, we need to ensure that all women have agents. We need to ensure that all women know um, and understand their oppression and they can fight their own oppression if we are going to liberate each other. So I'm saying that the Gender Desk is working on putting together programs that will ensure that we are able to do that for ourselves and, and our comrades as well as the community at large. It is a focus because we understand um, that women are critical to building movements. Azapo needs to have a bigger force of women and it is a conscious uh, effort that we are putting together to ensure um, that women, we get a lot more women into Azapo, that those women are not just sitting in corners, those women are active in Azapo, but they're active members in their communities and bringing about the change that we so want to see. Thank you. And on that note, it was 99 days ago that the new leadership of Azapo ascended. And a lot has happened in the past 99 days. What do you think can be mentioned that has stood above the rest in everything? There is the real the realizing of Azapo. There are provincial visits. There has been uh, the first and second uh, standing committee meetings. Uh, it's work in progress. Everything is work in progress. What can you say about the journey from when you were elected into office? We'll start with you, Kegelet, as the deputy president. Uh, wow, what what a journey! What a journey! So when we got elected, uh, I was just excited to be part of the movement. I was excited to be part of a group of people that were going to. At the time, I thought, just be a voice, because I've been saying there is no voice for Black people. Um, Black people are feeling despondent. Black people are frustrated. So when we got elected, I was just excited um, at being able to be one of those people that are going to be a voice. And fast forward to just a couple of days later, uh, we started doing the work and creating the ways that I did not anticipate we would have been able to do. For instance, I know that we have done things like we had a campaign um, for Rupalesa. Rupalesa is a woman who was beaten about uh, by her boyfriend. She was beaten purple, maroon, and green. Uh, and this man just could not see that he was wrong. He has a lot of money. He has a lot of influence. We were able to mount a campaign, a digital campaign, as well as um, a, a, a live campaign at court uh, that gave her support and it gave her strength um, to be able to face her perpetrator. And the perpetrator did not even want to have a trial. He pled guilty um, and which was a win for us as women, but it was also a win for Balesa. And it was a win where we were able to show what um, Azapo's voice is able to do for the people. Uh, we also ran a campaign where uh, uh, Pizzo Musimani was, um, was excluded uh, uh, by FIFA in a Best Coaches uh, uh, Award. And we wrote a letter to FIFA. Now, someone would have thought that is a small thing, but international media picked up on that and it became a conversation piece. Azapo was a conversation piece on issues that matter to our people. Now sports, any marketer will tell you that sports is a passion driver. Now, if we can associate our brands with the passions of our people, we are beginning to make inroads in associating brand Azapo with the ambitions of our people, with the, with the, yeah, with, with the desires of our people. And we are slowly doing that. So that particular project was able to do that for us. Um, and then there's another project that um, uh, I think was quite nice. It, it enabled us to have a massive conversation about who and what Azapa is. Uh, when uh, myself and comrade 
uh, Deputy SPI went to court um, and we went to sing the Wooly Bone. It was very frightening. But it was also quite exciting um, to speak truth to power. We had an opportunity to tell a Mabunu in the face uh, that we were not scared of you and that we know for a fact that Project Liberation um, has not been realized. And we want to announce to you that Azapo is back to finish that project. Now we were able to announce that true um, the Amabun, uh, but then we were also able to announce it to the nation at large because that um, created such a massive conversation of twi on Twitter and people were like, this is the Azapo we know. The Azapo that people will have been waiting for, the Azapo that gets involved, the Azapo that is part of the public discourse, the Azapo that carries and mirrors the aspirations of our people, but not just that the one that is willing to get into the boxing ring and fight for black people. So those are just some of the things um, that I think for me uh, are quite critical in terms of some of the things that we've been able to achieve. So our media presence, uh, we've announced that Azapo is back. We've announced that Azapo has been re-lionized. You can tell the lion is roaring. You hear it every single day. We are in the media. Uh, we are on the ground uh, doing things. We are with our communities. There was a project that happened, I think it was in the Eastern Cape, around schools and books. And our comrades were there um, fighting for the future of our children. Comrades on the grounds and in, 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 in townships and villages are excited to be part of reawakening the sleeping giant, what was a sleeping giant, uh, which is Azapa. So um, I think being able to galvanize our comrades uh, into action, because now we can see um, mushrooming actions of Azapo doing the actions, the things that are going to change the lives of our people and communities. So being able to, uh, to, to enthuse our own members into action has been quite an achievement um, for the last 99 days. Comrade Lazo, uh, can, we, can we quickly, I see Trikizot Tabula's hand is up. Can we quickly allow Trikizot to speak and tell us what is on her mind? Um, th thank you, Comrade Nori. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to hear me. Yes, I am. Thank you, um, and, and, and thank you to the woman for this discussion. Um, I just wanted to say, I am unable to imagine, speaking of liberating black women outside black men, you know, because according to my assessment, black men and black women are oppressed by the same people for the same reason. And at this point in time, I know not of any system that exists that is created by black men for black men and against black women in particular. But what I do know for sure is that the colonial white capitalists were able to strategically stratify our natural black family into groups of women, men, and children, which is why there are various institutions that are dedicated and designated to destroy these black people under these several categories. So when we speak of liberating black women, we must equally prepare to liberate the black men, whatever our personal feelings are of them. Because unlike other races, we don't have the privilege of speaking about men the same way other races do. Because what happens to black men at any level happens to black women. So we can't, not now anyway, say we want to be equal to black men because that would suggest we still aspire for the same oppression, if not worse. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the black, um, the black men are, I'm sorry, the black men we think rather are more equal, still get paid less. They do not own any means of production. You know, most of them are languishing in jails. Most of them are killed and die each and every day. So black women today need to collectively strategize and find ways to rebuild the black family because that is our cornerstone for power. If we don't, we will follow the trends of the West and they will come as they have been doing time and again to teach us how we should be as black women. 
Mm. Um, I think secondly, let me also say we must also guard heavily against the guidance of such women from international borders in directing our plight as black African women. Yes. You know, young women are taught in various institutions, especially the institutions of higher learning, that their mm -hmm. enemy is a black man. You know, a lot of money goes into this type of education or miseducation, if you like. And if we are, we are not aware, you know, this type of mis miseducation antagonizes um, the black family. Um, I, I don't know, Chair, if you can allow me to use a very sensitive and perhaps controversial subject as an example. Um, yes. You know, we, we speak of rape in marriage lately. Um, and when the mm. education of rape in marriage comes, it often comes firstly to the woman. You know, um, the woman is taken outside of her home to webinars, to seminars, to be taught what rape in marriage is. And when these webinars and seminars constantly happen, the woman moves from one point to the next and she's no longer in the same position with the black man that she lives with at home. And now when the confrontation eventually happens, if at all, you know, their reasoning is not the same because their understanding of issues is not the same. Mm -hmm. So these types of education happen under the guise of liberating black women. And we must guard against that because they take black women outside of the homes that they have built to miseducate them and further frustrate the black family as it exists. So I think when we speak of liberating black women, we must never forget to liberate the black man because we must operate as a family because our oppression um, 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 operates in the same manner as well. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, comrade Tabula. Um, <laughs> Comrade Lazola, let us continue with thank you, friend. and I hope I hope you can be able also to to address what Comrade Tigiza Tabula has raised, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but also speak to your official desk and the journey that has been from December to this 99th day. Mm. Thanks, Comrade Chair. I think I'll start with what Ukomri Tabula just raised because it's a very important aspect. And it's one of the things that often puts us at odds, at odds with each other as women. Um, and mm. this is why concept, concepts like intersectionality exist because intersectionality um, is, is uh, very much pro-Black. It is created by a Black woman, but it combines the Black identities of men and women under an oppression but most importantly, recognizing that the oppressions are not the same. We are oppressed together, but the oppressions are not the same. Due to patriarchy mm -hmm. and masculinity, our black brothers are still above us. And that's the first truth we need to admit. However, it does not mean they are not oppressed. And we see it every single day by their reaction, which has been more violent toward everyone, including black women. This is yes. why in educating ourselves as women together, we apply our, uh, those, our minds intersectionally. So we have conversations on sexism, but also understanding that we are not on the same level educational-wise, understanding these concepts and how to implement them. And number two, we understand them differently in different languages based on our lived experience. Therefore, this means that when we engage, we engage politically. And politics is the uh, contestation of ideologies, comrades. This needs patience from either side. If we are going to attack um, and if we're going to attack the system as it is, um, and if we are going to take over as a vapor, as the black nation, we need to do it having united. We also need to do it having understood each side has oppressions and each side relies on the other to battle those oppressions. Um, and, and I hope I've, I've, I've captured Ukomrej Ukikiza on that. And then in terms of uh, my desk, uh, Ukomrej, uh, Deputy President has touched on Balisa's campaign. One of the other campaigns that um, I brought forward uh, was a there was an opportunity, I think two weeks ago, when there was the Ukraine and Russia conflict. When that started, um, because we are in spaces where global digital campaigns happen every day, I was able to reach a comrade deputy president to actually start an online petition on a global campaign that reached over 30,000 people. These 30,000 people saw Azapo say to the government, 
We do not want our troops, our black brothers and sisters being sent to a Western senseless war. We first want it to be clear to us as a people why this war is being waged. And secondly, it also saw us agreeing with many of the people who were crying out to say, we need to first look at our South African context, we need to stay out of this war. And it was at the time um, the majority view in the country. And Azapo was able to lead on the digital campaigning platform on a global sphere. This means that over, over, in even other different continents were able to see what Azapo was saying. I think that was, for me, one of the biggest um, sort of impacts that I saw because we didn't only impact South Africa. We also had a voice on an international um, sort of a, a, a conversation. And through our, our in, in Beleko, we were able to also submit names of black heroines that have been excluded um, by the ANC. So through the in the Lego, we were able to submit EE names of black female comrades that were never celebrated, that fought during the liberation movement. Some are missing, some are on the streets, some actually were just never recognized. We submitted that to the Department of Women, Youth and Develop and, and, and People Living with Disabilities. And um, we have also stated, even in our Break the Bias uh, statement, that on the 27th of April, should this department not respond, we will go there and make sure that the names of these black heroines are on the walls and floors so that no one forgets these women. These women. And uh, we have released countless statements from the gender test, pushing a voice that um, understands gender consciousness, uh, within the guise of black consciousness and statements that are very clear that within black consciousness, that the black also represents women and it is inclusive of those women and not void of the masculine voice as well. Thanks, Comrade Chair. Thank you so much. Um, at this moment, I would like us, we, we have Utadu Upandelani Neforobodwe. I hope you can still hear me in that. Um, I'm handing it over to you. I see your hand. Must be very tired at this moment. <laughs> it's been up for quite a long time. When I follow about it. Okay, I think um, let's continue. It seems that he is not able to hear me. So let us continue. So um, there are more than 600 days ahead. Are you able to hear me? Yes. You are able to hear me now? Yes, I am. All right. Let me start my small sermon. Uh, there are issues that you are discussing that are very pertinent uh, to women. Uh, I'm a man, but I will be talking of issues that relate to women. You see, there are two things in, 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 in our existence. Yes. The first is that those who are the most oppressed must first identify that they are the most oppressed. And once they have identified that they are the most oppressed, they must be, bring about solidarity amongst themselves and cohesion so that that which uh, the deputy president of Azapo was talking about of a motive force, it doesn't become a motive force simply because there are 52% of women in South Africa. It doesn't become a motive force. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a motive force only when it is organized so that it becomes a very formidable force. Once it is accepted that women are oppressed, they are okay, they can remain like that forever if they do not recognize that they have to be organized. I've always told ANC fellows sometimes that these things of saying, no, we have 50-50, we have 50-50 people on position. To me, it doesn't make any sense because it is not the 50-50 that determines the motive force. It is this uh, uh, solidarity of women 
Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, in South Africa, women never want to be together. Um, there was a time when um, uh, the then Speaker of Parliament, Balekambet, tried to bring women across political parties so that they can have what they call a women parliament. Okay. Right? Mm. It failed at some stage, but I felt that was actually a logical consequence of uniting women across all these political parties to make sure that as the motive for, I, I consider them the motive force at actually, um, at the moment, they're, they're the most oppressed in our society, if we're talking about South Africa, the most oppressed. Despite the fact that there are men who are also living with them, that's okay. But if you look at the hierarchy of issues that pertains to women and those that pertains to men in South Africa today, those that pertains to men are more very, very uh, difficult in, indeed. So let me leave that uh, uh, platform of the motive force. The other platform is that systems under which we live, systems under which you, you've, you've got to recognize that you are living under a system. Mm. Because if you don't recognize that you are living under a system, you will never resolve the problem. Because the, the problem fundamentally, fundamental is not that women and men, they do A, B or two things. It's because those are consequences that the manifestations of a deep-seated system of oppression. Now, as you know, I don't want to preach it because you are Azabu people. I don't want to preach to you to say we inherited a system which is the same as that which was there before 1994. I think in Azabu that is a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, talking. So if we inherited that system, we know what it used to do. And although with ameliorations here because of Mandela's charisma and that, that, and people ended up following charisma of Mandela and not look at the system itself. And that is why we are in the situation we are in, because we looked at the charisma of Mandela, which even added uh, some verses on our national anthem, and we couldn't even see that they were added because of the charisma, right? There are many things I can talk about. So you must identify the system under which you live. Even as up or now, when you go to your platforms, please don't say we know it. The system sometimes ameliorates itself from time to time. And then it... so you must then again go and analyze who in South Africa is the motive force. Uh, well, during my time, when I was still young, we used to say the black working class, right? That's that's ours. But it is it. it I, I'm saying you must push further than just the black working class um, uh, in your in your platform. So, a system is what you've got to identify and fight against. And here is something that I was taught when I was still uh, very active. I was taught that you can't change a system by verbal assault. Yeah, verbal assault, it means me talking like I'm talking now, and I can share at the, at the system, I can do, it will never be able to be collapsible. So what is needed now, organize, organize, recruit, have people you can say, these are part of the motive force. Let me not go further than that. There are many things that I can talk about, but I, I, I'm just urging, organize, organize. Let, let's see a formidable uh, class of people who we can say this forms the basis of this motive force that will change the material circumstances in which we live. All right, thank you very much, uh, ladies and uh, comrades. Rolibu, that Rolibu. There's a challenge. I don't know how to speak after such greatness, but 
<laughs> it's all that right. Is it's all right. right. You see after that. Facts. Facts. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm inspired. I'm inspired because uh, my great teacher uh, acknowledges the fact that we are a motive force. He then takes it further and says, we must organize. And I spoke earlier about why it is important for us to go into communities and show women their oppression, show it to them. Once we have shown it to them, we must teach them how to deal with it in their homes and in their communities. That is the motive force that Baba is talking about that says, he is correct in saying we can speak. We can speak until we are blue in the face, but it is important that we go with the new as re-lionized as Zappo of an action oriented organization that goes into communities and does the work. We go into communities and we are tear, tear down patriarchy. See, it was no mistake for me to come into this platform and talk about how black men benefit from our oppression. I did it intentionally because I want men to understand that we are not oblivious to it. We are coming to them as a motive force to say, we need you to stop this antagonistic relationship with us and become partners with us because yes, we are mutually oppressed by whiteness, but we cannot be dealing with whiteness and be dealing with you who is supposed to be our ally. I am literally talking about black men becoming allies of black women so that as we dismantle the system of whiteness and white privilege, we do not have to deal with black patriarchy. So it mm. is so important that Ubaba is raising the issue of going back and ensuring that we know, women know what their oppression is because sometimes we fight each other because the other one is trying to show you your own oppression. So it's important that we are all singing from the same hymn book and understanding that we are oppressed. This is the system that we are fighting. And we then work towards pulling ourselves and each other out of that system and then working with our men to ensure that we pull down the rest of the system. Because like I said, until black women are free, none of us, including black men, will know freedom, including white women and white men. The economy of this country cannot grow until we include black women. We know for a fact that when they say, when you empower a woman, you empower a nation, it's not a joke. The reality of the situation is that we as women have the ability to stretch this rant. We also have the ability to make that rant benefit as many more people as we can. It is so important that women are brought into the economic space. We have to make sure that women are part of uh, this country's economy if we are going to grow the economy. More than that, we need to be aware that these little things of missing middle black texts and all of those things beat up on women, but as they beat up on women, they are shrinking the economy. So if we want to grow the economy, if we want to liberate this country, we have to focus on liberating the black, man, black woman. And this is not the job of the black woman. It is also the responsibility of the black men to ensure that where they are, be it at home, be it at work, be it within Azapo, be it outside on the streets, they do not allow the oppression of black women to occur in their presence. I did it intentionally. They have got to be our partners and allies. It is important. Otherwise we too will not be able to realize this ambition of liberating ourselves because we're constantly fighting. Thank you, Keke. Lazola, the Adena follow-up gives us a challenge to recruit. Mm. What have you to say on this matter of recruitment and what is the importance that you attach it? Unfortunately, we don't have much time, so um, kindly keep it minimal, but uh, qualitative, of course. <laughs> so I can't give a speech. Oh. <laughs> um, I think this challenge is very important um, because mm. we are not building and we are not in Azapo because uh, we, we are bored or we are trying to take over small scale. 
We are trying to change the nation. We are trying to create future generations. And we are not only restoring, but we are rebuilding, re-envisioning and re the black nation. Therefore, recruitment is important because they are young, middle and older minds that can exchange knowledge and that can help us change um, the world that we currently live in. And I think the most important thing in education for me that I attach, I mean, in, in, in recruitment, I attach it to education. We need to conscientize. It's not enough to just recruit because that's how we lose control of the narrative. That's how we start not singing from the same hymn book, quoting um, deputy uh, president. We need to conscientize. And conscientizing means going into communities and speaking to these women. We must understand when we go into communities, women know their oppression very well. They face it every single day, every second of every day. They face gender-based violence. They face rape in marriages. They face their children going um, to, to bed without, without any food. They face unemployment. You face it every single day. Therefore, when we go there, we need to go there having our own lived experience because we are not free as well. As long as there is a single woman that is not free, all women are not free. It doesn't matter how, at what level your English or conscientization level is. So when we go into communities, it is important to bring liberation tactics. And that is education that is conscientizing and giving women and men a home in Avapo, but creating fertile ground for engaging, creating fertile ground for ideas. It can't be that we tap ideas to only the SC, for instance. We can't tap ideas only there. Every single pocket of Azapo needs to be a space for contestation of ideas and creation of programs. We need to be practical. We recruit We delegate each other and we place each other in spaces of learning and programs. We can't just recruit people and sit them in recruitment papers or pockets. We need to create um, programs that, and and in fact, enact and even revitalize programs that were already there. So political classes um, are going to be very key. Um, and also uh, classes that make us understand the current economy and give us spaces to reimagine what economy we want politically, socially, have engaging conversations on the GDP, on the GDP, and how we as Azapo can affect it. Thanks, Komeche. Thank you so much. And um, we're looking now at the future. And with the future, we always see we always see potential, we see dreams, and we need to attach practicality to everything that we see in the future as a possibility. What would you think um, in your desk, Lazola, is the most crucial thing? We're talking today International Women's Day uh, that was celebrated on the 8th of March, and we all agree that we should not be swayed into celebrating victories that are not there. Mm. What can you say is the most crucial thing that is going to bring us to our own realization of achievements and celebration moments? Mm. Thanks, Kamecha. That's a very important question. I think from my perspective and experience working in the community, I will sound like a broken record, but education and conscientization is very important. Women Mm. know what they are facing. Women know that they have the ideas to break the bias. We need to turn that into conscientization. We need to turn that into education material. Just, there was a comrade earlier that asked about programs on empowering women. It's very yes. important that those programs are not only economically or politically based, but we need to look at the mind of the women, the mind of patriarchy, and the mind that we live in today, and educate. The gender desk needs to focus on equality being created through conscientization because women need to be agents. Women need to know that they are already agents. Hello. It's our agency and step up to the plate. There it can't be that I must wait for a comrade deputy president or a comrade uh, or you comrade to do something. As an agent educate and conscientize and get done. Thanks, comrade. Thank you, thank you, Comrade Lazola. Um, Comrade Kegeletso, you are today a deputy president. What is your view? What is 
your vision of the future where gender balance and perhaps expansion is concerned? Um, I think we spoke earlier about how the majority of the women in the current SC are deputy presidents. It is not a mistake. I've had a conversation where a, 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 a subject of the preparedness of women to take leadership. I then asked the question, Uguti, or I was then told, Uguti, there is a separate platform that prepares women yeah. for leadership. I then asked, Uguti, does a separate platform exist to prepare men for leadership? Or is it assumed that men are capable to head and women must be trained and women must be groomed for leadership where men are born and you know it's natural progression for them to be leaders. And um, I'm glad to say that by the time that conversation was over, um, people could see where I was coming from. Azapo is not a sexist organization. It's not a sexist organization. The fact that we have had, even many, many moons ago, a female president, and Azapo speaks to the progressive nature of Azapo. But what has happened is that there has been a lull, and a lull that mirrors society. Women have taken a step back in fighting for their own issues, in fighting for the issues mm -hmm. of their communities. You can see what we call a leadership gap is women sitting down and just being tired and just lacking in agency. So the future for me is being able to go and galvanize women. I said to you, the future for me is being able to go and galvanize women into a motive force the organized motive force that, that the uh, is talking about, that will then be on standby to take on leadership because these women will know that they are capable, they understand the issues, they can represent the issues, they can come up with solutions, not just for themselves, but for the nation. The whole idea is to develop a group of people, be it men and women, that can identify problems and find solutions that will change the lives of our people. But if it means that we need to have an, an extra focus on women, then we must do that. Because when we talk about affirmative action or balancing the scale, it means that if the scale is that high for men, we need to put a block at the bottom that will ensure that women can gradually get to that point. So there must be a concerted effort. And I know for a fact that the women in Azapo, the very deputies in Azapo are working very hard together as a collective to ensure that there's a lot more of us in the SC come the next election. So that's, that's, that's all I can say is that we are working to ensuring that we bring in more women into the leadership. Because we also know, we know that women are good at organizing. We know that women are good at recruiting. We know that women are good at building and growing things. Azapo is the hope of black people. Azapo has to grow to realize the mission of liberating black people. And for it to do that, it will need to galvanize women. It will need to intentionally go and recruit women who are not afraid to recruit other women, who are not afraid to hit the streets and do the hard work necessary to build a movement. We are builders. So as Azapo, we also need to capitalize on that and get those women into Azapo to grow this movement. Thank you, Kekeleto. Um, I live in the Eastern Cape, and one of the saddest things that are happening in the Eastern Cape, and I will pick Grandstown, which is now called Magana or Maganda. The women in Grandstown do not have access to running water. 
they do not have access to clean water. It's a struggle to get good quality of water for use at home. The infrastructure is totally dilapidated. You cannot even drive 10 meters in a proper tarred road structure. What do you say to a woman that is trapped in that situation who is forced to drink water where the cows are also drinking their water? What would you as an Azapo leader say to that woman? How can she change her own situation and make sure that she is not swallowed by the swamps that, have, uh, that she has been plunged into? Lazola. Thanks, Komete. Um, I think being born and bred in the Eastern Cape and having lived in Grandstown for over five years, I, I definitely know the struggle. And I've seen it. When you drive into Grandstown, you can see the divide. You can see where water stops flowing. And I think one of the biggest things, because in the past we've tried to tackle this in small pockets, is to understand that the way Grandstown has been designed is that uh, when you go outside of the university, and uh, we will say white areas, there is no water um, circulation. And I'm going to go back as a solution um, to, to what has been said in, in this conversation is that women need to band together. Because I can guarantee you there is no municipality, ward councillor, or any seating that can ignore the women of Grahamstown coming together and going to these offices and actually inquiring where is the budget to fix the infrastructure? Because there is infrastructural budget in Grahamstown. And there is infrastructural budget that is specially set for the township areas to fix water. There are two fundings that are specifically fundraised from the university space and separately that are dedicated to creating water in the township. This is why education contentization is important because women need to know that one, and then women need to come together and not only express solidarity, it's not a solidarity at this point. We become the women that must bend together and take care of our issue. We become agent enough to go into these offices and not wait for a councillor to go to the municipality, but we go as women ourselves and we go and inquire and we gain access to these records so we can hold um, leadership accountable and ensure that uh, action is being uh, put forward for these types of, of, of issues. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Comrade Gege, I have visions of women that are stuck in a container, shipping container, that is in motion at sea, deep at sea. These women are coming from different spots in South Africa. They do not know their destination. Some of them don't even know how they got to be in that shipping container. But definitely, their ultimate destination is where they will be used in the sex trade or at worst, e body parts multi trading. To date, it seems to me that we are not serious about getting to the bottom of human trafficking. We have had young children that have gone missing for both three years, uh, four years now. And somehow I feel that the investigations divisions are, are really failing our communities. We have young women that have left their homes going to shops and ended up without a trace. I know for a fact that in 2019, there was a discussion about South Africa and human trafficking in Geneva, in one of the United Nations meetings. And the shocking disclosure there was that we are at, at number three, flagged as number three in the world for human trafficking came as a shock. Of course, I, I, I might be slightly incorrect as number three in the world, but we're in the first five. Since then, it seems whenever a woman goes missing, uh, they are going to be posted on Facebook and, um, and there will be a lot of snide comments about, no, just give it a few more hours, she'll be coming back from wherever she is. But unfortunately, there are families that are sitting there. What do you think is going on between missing people, particularly women and children, and investigations that are not getting to the bottom of things? And how should we 
find means to keep this because we cannot go on having people unaccounted for. Comrade, um, Azapo has 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 placed itself in a place of being action orientated. Now we can analyze the situation by saying one, in the last month, have you seen a media article on human trafficking? None. Have you seen in the media a program talking about educating communities about human trafficking? None. In the last year, what campaigns have there been on human trafficking to educate um, people, communities, about the prevalence of human trafficking, how to protect yourself, how to identify a potential threat? We have not seen any of those. Azapo is not in government, but Azapo is preparing to be government. It is therefore our responsibility to mount such a campaign, one, to ensure that our people are safe, to mount a campaign against a lazy state, an inefficient state, where we can then challenge the state in court for its inefficiencies in protecting women and children. But also, whilst we do that, we need to be understanding of the structural systems that exist that put women in danger. We know for a fact that the majority of young girls get trafficked with the promise of a job in, in the UAE, in America, and all of those, because our systems back here say that young people cannot be employed. So unemployed young people are desperate for work opportunities, and so they fall victim to these things. We know for a fact um, that uh, sex work has become an option for a number of young black girls because the economy is not open for those. So we also need to understand that there are systemic structural issues that aid or even worse, that perpetuate um, the, the, the exposure of children and women uh, to, to, to human trafficking. So as we approach this as a Zappo, we need to look at systemic, at the system, we need to look at campaigns we can launch, we need to look at how we can challenge the state, but also we need to look at what we can do in communities to change the lives of young women and girls. Um, young babies go missing because the mother has had to go to work, but there isn't a facility for the child to go and play. Or the mother is busy with house chores. She's cleaning, she is cooking, and the child slips away to go outside where she thinks it is generally safe. And the child is never to be seen. So it is our responsibility to look in our communities and say, what can we do? What are the small things that we can do to aid these things? Can we create places of safety for children to play whilst the mother does whatever it is that she needs to do, be it just breathing? and watching TV for an hour without having to watch and worry about where her child is. We understand that the world is a dangerous place for children. We live in communities of poverty, of violence that are created by the system, by the way. Where, you know, our, our communities didn't just wake up into these violent jungles that we live in. They were systemically designed to create the kind of environment that we live in. So we have to understand it in the broader context of what it is that our country is. And as Zapo, as an organization that is preparing to be government, needs to start building networks and, 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 and safety platforms for our communities. We are an action-oriented uh, organization. We need to go and do things in communities um, before we become government and show communities what will happen the day we become government. Thank you so much. So in essence, we do agree that South Africa doesn't quite have stories of celebration, particularly related to the days that have been set aside on our behalf, right? No. We do not. Lazola, do we? We do. Can you please repeat that, comrade? No, I'm, 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 I'm posing a question to the two of you. Do we agree that South African women do not actually have stories to, to make us celebrate? Join the so-called celebration across the world. Do you agree with the statement? No. I heard the tail end of celebration across the world, comrade. If you can, for the last time, please, for network sake. 
the, 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 the question is that, do we all agree that we have no stories that would that would make us celebrate? We, we cannot celebrate anything. We, we, we have to have any if they are. Are you able to hear I me? think that, yes, I can hear you, Com. Thanks. I think, Comrade Chair, there are, there are things that we can be proud of, and there are things to celebrate. However, I think that on a day like International Women's Day, it is, we are not at a space where we can only focus on celebration. We have to use each and every opportunity where women and men of the Black nation are coming together to engage on how to better, how to create say, a safer world for women, and also how to create more agent women. We are not at a time where we can sit and celebrate. But there are um, wings for women. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we just need to maybe beef up in, in the other spaces so that we can drive the agenda going forward to include our South African women as well. In, I, well, I think, I think more realistically, we just need to have our own days for celebration that are more relevant to us because obviously when we Comrade Naspiwa, I, 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 I don't. Go ahead, Comrade. Okay. So I, I, I do think that we have um, beacons that we can celebrate. We, we've seen women in science. We've seen women in agriculture. Uh, we've seen women, some women in, 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 in politics, um, doing some amazing work, even within organizations um, that infantilize Africa, uh, like the UN. We have seen women go in there and really try and change the lives of women um, in the continent. Uh, we've seen the rise of uh, Black women leaders in the continent. So we have, you know, bits and pieces and, 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 and beacons of, uh, of hope. For, for black women and black women politics, um, as well as women in business. I mean, I'm in that space and I've seen some really amazing things come through uh, in terms of innovation and innovation that is directed at changing the lives of communities on the ground. Um, so they, they are beacons. But also I wanted to say, um, South Africa, unfortunately, even though it's not by our doing, we are part of the global community. What we need to do uh, is change the narrative on the continent as well as ourselves. Um, when I, I just spoke now about the infantilization of Africa and the begging bowl syndrome that seems uh, to be pervasive, where we are not seen to be the answer to the world's problem. And it's about time that we uh, became the answer, the innovative answer to the world's problems. Um, it is so critical that we do that. And so it is so important that we celebrate our small wins. We still have August the 9th, which is very focused internally um, to look at what we have done as women. But we also need to occupy the international space. We are not second class citizens of the international community. We should then see ourselves um, as active players in the global world. Um, Russia has a plan. For South Africa. Can you see how small Russia is? Can you see how mm. Africa is? Russia has a plan for Africa. China has a plan for Africa. The US has a plan for Africa. Who do we have a plan for? ASAPO is not going to be that organization that allows the world to make us second class citizens. ASAPO, when it ascends power, will have a plan for China, for Australia, for, you know, for every other country in terms of how we use whatever it is they have to be able to empower and grow the continent. So we are part, we are global players. We need to look with a global lens and play in that space. Thank you, Comrade. It has been a very engaging <laughs> two hours. And, um, you know, sometimes I wonder, but I know that there is great potential. I know that we can, this cannot be the end of this country in its current state. I know that uh, every black person is deep down in their hearts looking for a change that is really going to address the black 
needs of this country. And I'm happy that um, in all the gloom that we have seen over the past 30 years, and it has been a long period, we are now seemingly taking a journey that is, 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 is injecting hopefulness into our situations. It, it, it's, so, it's so motivating to see that in the end, we do have people that we can look up to. And even though today became the meeting of deputies, let us look forward to a day when it's going to be more than just a meeting of deputies. I hope in everything that we do, in all the deliberations that we have had today, minus the glitches, but I always want to say, uh, you know, there's no mistake in, in the universe. There was a reason for all the glitches that we, we encountered today. And maybe those glitches that we, we experienced also speak to the state of women of the country, the state of women of Azania. They are in turmoil. They are in a space that is not favorable for their better development. And so maybe this also becomes an opportunity to go out there, identify what is it that needs to be done. Go out and recruit, not only shout, not only speak in tiny corners, but make sure that we take the battle to where it's supposed to be taken. On a parting note, um, we are all dressed in black. I think this should also speak to the fact that women are in a state of mourning. And when we rise from the state of mourning, look out for the real ionized woman of Azami. Are we all together on this one? Yeah. Lazola is muted. Um, Kegeleto. No, I'm. I'm. I'm in. I'm in agreement. Um, we are in mourning. Um, but I want to say, um, like the phoenix, we are rising. The lion is roaring, and I want to say, actually, Azapo is a lioness. It is a lioness that is protective. It is a lioness that is fierce. It is a lioness that is ready to roar, to protect and to change and to bite if it needs to bite. And so we know for a fact that the women of Azapo, and, and, and I wanted to say, I went to the SC and I met a group of people in the Azapo SC that are committed to realizing the vision of re-lionizing Azapo to be the movement we so need for our people. I came out of the SC inspired. I was ready to work. And I'm sure you can see the amount of work that comes out of the SC. Most of us have jobs. Most of us have either have businesses, but we are working because that group of women and men are committed to re-lionizing this movement so that it can realize the ambition of our people. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to serve with such amazing group of people who are so committed and who so love black people that they were able to enthuse and infect me with the love of the movement as well as the love of black people that we know as a collective that we cannot fail. We cannot fail in the vision of realizing Azapo because it holds the dreams and aspirations of our people. And we pledge our commitment to our people, um, our, our people in the branches, our people on the streets, people who are yet to become members of Azapo to say, we are going to do everything in our power to make sure that Azapo becomes the lioness that makes, that brings about the change we were robbed off in 1994. Thank you. Thank you. Lazola, on a parting note. Thanks, Komeche. Um, I think we are in mourning. I agree with that. But I think our mourning is not laying down. I think we are on our knees. 
um, at this particular point, we are on our knees and we are standing up. We are collecting strength from the earth. That is where black people collect their strength. From nature, from earth, linking arms together. We are recruiting, we are conscientizing, we are coming together. So that when we stand, it is not one person standing, but it is a giant that is re-standing. Because Azapo is a giant in and of itself. And it stands on, on, on the shoulders of giants that fought for liberation. And it is that blood, sweat, and tears that, and those bones that we stand on today. And thus far, um, we, have come, we have come to unite. We have come to learn. And I believe I am seeing a new up. Mm. And I see it in and of myself as well. Azapo currently comes inside of you and re-lionizes you personally within the SC. And it is a space of support. It is a space that is not only launch padding at this point, but we are taking over, comrades. And I think it's important as a passing, a passing note that we look around and see that we are truly capturing the Black nation and taking it to newer heights. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all the participants and thank you for all, to all the people that left everything that they could have done. It's Sunday today and uh, in tra tradition in South Africa, Sunday chillers. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you for all the views. Thank you for all the opinions. And thank you for making it today.